Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. I never take it for granted. It's a huge honor to get the opportunity to speak to the family. Um, I was just thinking about that during worship. I, as I was getting my mic set up, I just started crying. I was like, man, this is such a privilege to be able to, you know, share what's, what the Lord has put in my heart with you. So I'm really honored to do that and super excited. There's a lot on my heart today, so I'm going to have to like rapid fire. So buckle up, get ready. <laughs> and I, I, I want to just warn you, pre-warn you too, like I'm a very uh, overt, like as, as uh, Aaron was saying, I, I really believe in the overt, like this radical gospel of Jesus. So I'm going to really talk a lot about how basically like this overt reality of what does it look like to impact every community, to bring revival into every community through your life, like in an overt way, just like radical with your life. And I believe that it's, it's something that's available for all of us that it's, it's something that we can all walk in, even in the midst of whatever career or uh, you know, whatever sphere of society we're in, we can all have, uh, this, we all have this command and this call to advance the kingdom of God in the nations and in our communities and all over the world. Uh, so I know it's not something for select believers, it's something for every believer to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven into your environment. Um, so I'm super excited. As I was thinking about, you know, revival, what does revival look like in every community? What does it look like for us to carry the presence of God, to carry revival into our, our own community, our own area, our own workplace? And I, I couldn't go any farther than just Jesus <laughs> and the life of Jesus. I'm like telling you, like, Jesus is revival. He is revival. Revival is a person, and his name is Jesus. So it's not so much about like what I can do, it's what he does and what he did. It, not, just, it, not just what he did as a model and as an example to me, but also him living his life in me and through me to the world around me. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same Jesus. The goal is that we would manifest, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm excited, but the goal is that we would manifest and reveal the same Jesus that is revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would actually be fleshed out in my life to those around me. And I, one time I did this study, I did this extensive study in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I was really curious about all of the miracles that Jesus performed and how many of these miracles were out and about in the world and how many of them took place in the Jewish temple. And I did this extensive study in all four Gospels, and I found that 90% of the miracles that Jesus performed were in the public, and only 10% were done in the temple. I think it's meant to be the same call for you and me. That God, whatever is happening here, would almost be a micro for the macro life you live Monday through Saturday. It, this would be the, like a, a training ground for raining out there, training for raining out in our community. So... The reality is we do. We only get a limited time together through our, our life groups and our Sunday mornings. So this is meant to be this place to train to then actually live and manifest Jesus all the other days of the week that we're out and about in our normal life, around people, around everyday people. And this is the life that Jesus lived. Like one of, one, Another thing that I remember reading, I was looking at Jesus. He actually made this declaration. He said that all... The most miracles and signs and wonders that he performed were, happened and took place in Bethsaida and Capernaum and Nineveh, these three cities, but particularly those two, Caper, uh, Capernaum, Capernaum and Bethsaida. And these two cities are literally in a three to five mile distance of one another. Three to five mile distance. If you Google map it, it would take about a three hours to walk from one city to the other city. In Jesus' day, if they were, that was their mode of transportation, just walking along, it would have taken him three hours. And he said that most of the miracles, all the signs and wonders, the most that he performed was right there. Those two cities are in Galilee, which Jesus settled in Galilee, in Nineveh, by the Sea of Galilee. So what that tells me is that 
the majority of the breakthroughs that Jesus saw were in the context of his home environment. It wasn't found, now he did this, Jesus did special outreaches and special mission trips to like Jerusalem. He did these extended little mission trips with his 12 disciples. He's, let's go on a mission trip, boys. We're going to Jerusalem. But overall, the majority of his three years in ministry was spent right in his hometown, performing signs, wonders, and miracles, revealing the goodness of the Father to his neighbors and his community right in front of him. And sometimes for me, I had this idea that Jesus was this um, great, great revivalist missionary, that he went on, he just did itinerant stuff, he traveled around, and you know, we get this hype, this, there's a sense of hype or excitement of doing like a two-week mission trip or doing a, you know, a, a, there's a sense of hype that comes with it. But Jesus didn't live with this sense of hype or this, these special events. He lived just every day being, going about his father's business right in his normal environment. Am I, am I, uh, are you guys connecting with this? Yeah. So he's really our model. He's our example of, this, of what it looks like to live a normal Christian life. Because if everything that he did, he did as God, then I'm in awe. Like, I, there's a level of awe. I'd be in awe with the goodness of God. Like, man, everything that Jesus did in those three years recorded in the four Gospels, I would eat, be in awe of who my God is. But if he did all those things as a man, then I'm held responsible of living that same life that he modeled for me. Does that make sense? So one time I was reading, this was probably like seven years ago, I was reading um, Matthew, Matthew 4 through 9, and you can jump there with me. It, we aren't going to go through all of this because it would take the whole day. Um, I'm going to paraphrase a lot of it, but I want to read a little bit of passage in Scripture and the end of Matthew 4, and then I'll tie it up and read the end, and I'll summarize bullet points throughout each chapter and then end with Matthew 9. And this is amazing. One time I was reading this one day, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's, you know, all these amazing things that are happening in these, in these five chapters. But one day when I was reading this, I suddenly realized as I started to look at the ge geography and literally just look at the actual map of that area that he was ministering in, I realized that these five chapters may have actually taken place in 48 hours. And I'm like... What a crazy 48 hours. A lot of us would aspire to see what Jesus saw in 48 hours in a lifetime, and this was just a 48-hour glimpse of the life he lived for three years straight. Wow. And it starts with a, micro, a macro, and then it zooms into a micro, and then it goes back out to a macro. So I'm going to show you this. The macro, he went throughout, this is verse 23, 24, and 25 of chapter 4. And he, this is Jesus, he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great, great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. This is just an intro, a macro intro to the life that Jesus lived for three years. He appears on the scene and starts preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And everywhere he goes, the sick are brought to him. The oppressed are brought to him. Good news is preached to the poor. And then it, it micros into seeing the crowds. He went up on top of a mountain. And he proceeds to preach one of the greatest sermons that's ever been done in the history of mankind. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the, the Lord's Prayer. There's so much in there. He preaches this stunning, stunning sermon, chapter 5 through 7. And then this is where chapter 8 begins. Keep in mind, there aren't chapters in the normal Bible. There aren't chapters in the original Bible. Keep, look at this, what it says. And when he came down from the mountain, what mountain? The one he was just on preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And as he comes down from the mountain, and it's more like a big hill, and he's on his way down the mountain, suddenly there's a leper there, and he touches the leper, and the leper's cleansed instantly. And then it says, when he entered Capernaum, verse 5 in chapter 8, Capernaum was at the bottom of the mountain. So you have to keep in mind that he preaches this sermon. 
maybe walks about 30 minutes down a mountain and he enters into a city. This is all happening in one morning. He enters Capernaum and it says that there's a man, a centurion, a centurion and he comes and he says, my servant is, uh, is paralyzed, he's, he's struggling and Jesus heals his servant. And then verse 14, and when Jesus entered Peter's house, you know where Peter's house was? Peter's house was in Capernaum historically. So Jesus, he goes down from the mountain, heals a leper, cleans, heals a, par- a paralyzed person, enters to Peter's house to get some rest. He's tired. And he gets into his, uh, Peter's mother-in-law house, and they see that, he sees that hit Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And he touches her, and the fever instantly leave, leaves her, and she jumps up and starts making them dinner. As they're sitting at the door, they're sitting at the door, and they're just looking to rest, and they're eating their food. Suddenly, there's this loud cry that's coming out of their door, from their door, out in the streets. And they hear this, built, this roaring, this chanting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he gets up, he rises from the table and he's like, man, I just was looking forward to having dinner with my friends, but all right. He opens the door and the whole city, Mark says that the whole city gathered at the door. An entire city gathered at the door because of the, 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 the power on his life. And it says that he spent the whole night casting out demons and laying hands on the sick and healing all the entire city was healed in an evening. And in Mark's account, it says that he, he prayed all throughout the night and was wearied. And as the sun began to rise, he gave order to his disciples, we need to rest. Let's get in a boat and let's get out of here. So it, this has just been, we're just entering 24 hours. He heals all the sick in the Capernaum throughout the night. And he, then they're wearied and they, they jump into a boat and they're going across the Sea of Galilee and the, as you can, if you can picture it, you know, when you go out early to fish and the sun's starting to rise, you get that hues on the, on the, um, on the water of, the, of all the rays of light. And they're, ga- they're just there. They're at that point. They're weary. They were up all night praying for the sick, casting out demons. And they get in this boat and they're heading across to the other side, which would have only been a couple hours of a boat ride, a few hours of a boat ride. And as they're going across, a storm arises. And Jesus is sleeping. You wonder why. <laughs> Because he's tired. Because literally he's been going crazy, praying for people for 24 hours straight, no sleep. And he, he suddenly rises and he commands a storm to stop. And a storm literally ceases at the power of his, of his voice. Medi- immediately they're transported and they hit land. When they hit land, they all jump out. And this demon-oppressed man that has literally been tormenting and basically oppressing a whole region. Everybody's afraid to go out to this cave and he's been chained and would break his chains and would torment people and would attack people and was violent and would cut himself. And this man that is literally oppressing a whole city, again, a whole community, Jesus comes all the way there just for this one man. And he casts the demons out of this, this entire legion of demons out of this man. And they go into pigs and they run down, the, the, down into the water. And the people seeing this, they're so terrified. They're like, get out of here. Like, leave our city. What is this? So he jumps back in a boat, and it says that he goes back to his hometown, chapter 9. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own town. This is still day two. When he arrived in that town, he actually called one of his disciples. He saw Matthew, a tax collector, and he said, hey, come and follow me. And Matthew leapt up from his tax collecting table and followed Jesus. And as he was talking to the people... Suddenly, a, girl, a woman or, or somebody came saying that their child was dead. So he gets up and he goes there and he raises a girl from the dead. And as he's going, a, lo- a woman with issue of blood gets healed just by accidentally touching, in some ways, he, she purposely, but just touching the hem of his clothes. And then it moves on and as he go, it says, this is verse 27, verse chapter 9. And as Jesus passed on from there, these are all statements of in throughout your day. And he passed on from there and he went here. As he passed on from there, two blind men called out to him and he healed them and their eyes were opened. And then as he was going away from there, a demon oppressed man came and he, he was unable to speak. And with the word, the man was healed and he could speak. And this is where it ends and it zooms back out after those 48 hours. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, and now you understand why he said this. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You see that in 48 hours, all the stuff that Jesus did? Oh my gosh. <laughs> does it feel overwhelming? <laughs> does, it, does it feel impossible? Because the reality is that this is actually what we're called to do. Jesus didn't leave any room for, for excuses or leniency. He, then he commanded the disciples in his prayer. He said, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he commanded them in Mark 16, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And another command in Matthew 10, when he first sent out the apostles, he sent them out and he said, go therefore to the lost sheep. And he made this command. He said, as you go, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, you know, cleanse lepers, freely you have received, freely give. So this is our command. Like This is literally the call for us as disciples. He gave the same command. He said, see the life that I'm living. Now you live it too. I am your model and your example. Live this life. Expand the kingdom of God. Advance the kingdom of God. Preach the gospel. Whatever you do, maybe, you know, whatever you do in life, there was, uh, there was Luke, the great physician. Maybe you're a physician. Maybe you're a doctor. Maybe you're a businessman. But he says, that's great. Do whatever you're called to do, but heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out devils while you're doing it. <laughs> it's, that's the, this is the command. This is the call. We're called to represent this Jesus to the world. This same Jesus, we're called to represent him. We're called to model him. The great commission means that we are to continue the mission. The, same, the mission hasn't changed. The same mission that he walked in, work out to continue. It's, and it could sound really overwhelming. And the reality is that it is, because I'm telling you, it's 100% impossible. <laughs> it's good news. It's 100, this call is 100% impossible. It's the mission impossible. So the thought that I'm having is like, how can we live this call? If it's impossible, how in the world can we live that same call? Jesus said that we would do greater works than he did. How can we live that same call, this same standard? Because for me, I'm gripped with, I can't lower the standard to my experience. I have to be called up to the experience that he has set. Because everything he did, he did as a man in right relationship with the Father. In Philippians, it said he laid aside his divinity. He laid it all aside and went to a cross. Everything that he did in this, on this earth in his ministry was as a man. He, says, he even said, he said, I can do nothing of my own accord. I only can do what I see the Father doing and say what I see the Father saying. So there's a clue and insight, again, talking about Jesus in Acts 10.38 of how we can do this impossible mission. In Acts 10, 38, it says, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The only way you can do this mission, the only way you can do good and heal all, is anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. It's an impossible mission. It can't be reduced down to my own human ability. At some point, that's where the natural crosses into the super. When you get the super onto the natural is when it's in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You guys following me here? Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. To summarize this or put it a little smaller, basically what it's saying is the kingdom is dot, dot, dot in the Holy Spirit. 
How does the kingdom of God come near? How does the kingdom of God come upon? Jesus even made this statement in Matthew 12, 28. They were persecuting Jesus and saying that he, he was operating in the miraculous through a demon. And Jesus was like, man, you've got it all wrong. He was like, if I cast out a demon by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So how does the kingdom of God come? By the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Where our ability ceases, his begins. I remember this one time when I was like 17 years old. I had this dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit that just changed my life. And it wasn't... You have to understand, it's not that we go around always feeling um, power or feeling something. Most of the time, we don't, we don't feel a, sp- a specific thing. But this, there was a seed. Every encounter with the Holy Spirit, every encounter with God is a seed that can, produce, that can grow into a tree and produce fruit. So there's always a seed revelation in any encounter you have here or at home that is meant to produce fruit and grow. And in this encounter, I was honestly just so hungry. I was crying out for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just felt like I had been raised in the church. I had known, I knew that the Holy Spirit was in me because Titus 3, 5 talks about that, that we've all been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So I knew that the Holy Spirit was in me when I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I just felt like I wasn't seeing the power that I saw Jesus walking in upon my life. So I was crying out for a, a, a baptism or a filling of the Holy Spirit. And I ended up in this, out in the hills, deep in the hills. I grew up in Washington State, so there's all these mountains and evergreens. And I ended up deep back in these uh, totally, it's not even a, it wasn't even a park. It was owned by one of the Native American tribes, but the, it hadn't been developed. So it was just kept, preserved exactly how it was hundreds of years ago. And I went back there, and I'm hiding out. And I was hiding out to pray, and I, I saw this huge rock. And there was this giant, almost like a mountain, and there's this cable that hangs from the side of it. And it's like a full-on, I mean, this, this straight. And you don't have climbing gear. If you want to get up to the top of that thing, and you can see the border of Canada from this mountain. I mean, it's just beautiful. And I had never been up there. I was terrified of heights. But if you want to get up to the top, you literally, as if this was the rock, you have to climb the ca- grab the cable and just walk yourself up it. Like this. I mean, it's just creepy. And I was alone. I'm like, you know what? I, I, for some reason, maybe it was childlike. I was just like, maybe God's up at that mountain. I'm going to go up there. It was probably really stupid. But I'm climbing the rock, and I'm all alone, and I'm terrified of heights. But as I'm climbing, the fear of heights suddenly is getting lifted off of me. And I'm about halfway up the rock, hanging onto this cable, and maybe, suddenly the power of God hits me, and it feels like my finger was shoved into an uh, electric socket thing. And I'm literally grabbing this cable like, <laughs> like hang, I'm like, oh my gosh, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> What's going on? I was like, why didn't, why didn't you wait until I was safe? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm literally like hanging on for dear life. And somehow, I don't know how, but somehow I managed to make it to the top. And I laid out on the top of this boulder. And the power of God was just surging over me in waves and waves and waves. And this is the thing I want you to catch. The, where there was one thing he kept on saying to me over and over again. He said, Micah, you are the Ark of the Covenant, the same glory and presence that dwelled in the meeting tent, in the Ark of the Covenant, now resides inside of you. You are the holy habitation of me. My presence lives inside you and is upon you. And, and, and it changed my life. The electrical feeling stopped. I, haven't, I don't know if I've ever had an encounter like that ever again. But the revelation is available for all of us that we are the Ark of the Covenant. We are the Ark of this new covenant. We are carriers of the presence of God. And it changed my life. I'm serious. I started suddenly learning, like partnering with him and, and being aware of him because that he was, that he was always up with me. He didn't come and go like a gypsy, he remained because of who he is, but also because of who he has made us to be. We're the righteousness of God. Amen? His presence is what makes the impossible possible. 
how could we expect to do what Jesus did if we don't have what Jesus had? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> In John 1, 32, it shares the account of the baptism of Jesus. And Jesus is, you know, goes to meet, be with John, to be submerged in water, just to do it in all righteousness, to, to, to fulfill all righteousness. And as he's baptized, he comes out of the water. And John said that he saw, he said it, he saw this. He saw the clouds part And the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove, and he said that it remained on him. I've heard Bill Johnson say this amazing thing. How would you live your life if you wanted a dove to remain on you? A lot of people say cautiously, carefully, but that's not really true because that would be like legalism or... That would, that would lead to perfectionism. How, do we, how would we walk if we wanted the dove to remain on our shoulder? We would walk every step with the dove in mind. Every step I make, I would make aware of the dove. Because the Bible says, like, don't quench and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We... we we grieve him when we do what's wrong and we quench him when we don't do what's right. And I, I'm like convicted because I, I noticed I may be really skilled in evangelism. I may be really skilled at certain things because I've just basically been doing it a lot. I'm not even, it's just that I out, put hours and hours and hours and hours of praying for people out in public. But like I suddenly have been realizing the last few months, I feel like a novice and a baby when it comes to actually learning how to host the presence. And at the end of the day, Jesus even said, depart from me. You know, you did all these miracles, but depart from me, I never knew you. The primary call for each and every one of us isn't actually the kingdom come, will be done. It isn't actually preach the gospel. Our primary call is to host the presence, to host the dove. Awareness. living with an awareness. And, and like, I, I thought it was interesting because I don't think Nicole knew what I was speaking on today, but what she was talking about. Let us, you know, let's pray for one another that we're more hungry and that we're more aware of his presence. And I feel, so it was, it's really, it confirmed that, okay, I think I'm, I, I, I'm supposed to speak on this. <laughs> because this is the goal, man. Like, it, it's not about anything will become a pressure even if it's our, your actual unique gifting or unique call, the call for us to make disciples, the call for us to advance the kingdom will become a pressure instead of a pleasure when it's outside of the context of just hosting his presence. You start to get weary and run down, teetering with burnout if you, if you rest on the shoulders of your own gift rather than the gift giver. His presence is it. The amount of people that we're seeing get saved, like the stuff that God is doing, I know through your own life, Kenny Block told me an amazing testimony of him getting uh, a word of knowledge and radically praying for this couple at uh, McDonald's, or no, Burger King, the last week. I mean, it was an amazing story. And then uh, Kristen had shared this story with me about going into Walmart, and she was drawn to this lady, and she couldn't shake it, so finally she went up to her, and this lady ended up, was it she felt heat and warmth in her body and was healed in her body, like major breakthrough, like the stuff that God's doing through your life and the stuff, you know, that we're seeing, like it doesn't, how many of you know that that doesn't come from how well we pray? And that doesn't, the, the, the people getting saved doesn't come from my eloquency to preach because out there in public, I'm honestly not, not the most eloquent gospel preacher. Like I literally sometimes stumble and bumble through my words. I never had a, maze, a real dark story and I, I, a lot of my friends have that are even evangelists. Like, I just was raised in the church. I'm a PK. 
I really, I tried really hard to walk away from God, but I, 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 I was like, I was a terrible sinner, basically. Like, I was like, I tried really hard. I'm like, I'm going to be a sinner. I'm going to be bad. And I like, it was really funny. Most people probably would have laughed at me. It's like, oh, you know, I was, I tried everything. I'm going to swear really bad. I'm going to have a dirty mouth. And I, it just felt weird. Everybody was like, what are you, I had non-believing friends, atheists. They're like, Micah, what are you doing? Like, even them, they're like, what are you doing, Micah? And then I had one, one time I, when I was a teenager, these are BC days, I tried to get drunk with some friends, and the next morning, the friend's older brother, who literally is a total atheist, he's a part of your himself, he looks at me, and he's like, Micah, he looked at his brother, he's like, I get why you did this, bro, I get why you did that last night, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't get why you did that, your dad would be very disappointed. And he's not even a believer. Your dad would be really disappointed. And I was like, oh my gosh, it convicted me. So anyways, all that, I was like a terrible, so I, I don't have a lot of stories to relate to people. Like I really don't like, but then we're seeing opioid people and atheists and LGBTQA and all kinds of people coming to the Lord these last two years. And it's all through just, it's, it, this is what it's through. The presence how can you preach a thumbly, bumbly, terrible message, try to like get a good gospel message together, and suddenly somebody starts crying and they're shaking and wanting to give their life to Jesus? How? The presence. <laughs> Is this helping you guys? See, we could go after 20 things I could go after being a van. I, this, I've done this. I, I feel like the Lord was just recalibrating my heart because you get really comfortable. And, I, it, and I, I didn't realize it's actually a form of pride. Pride is basically dependency upon yourself and not on the, not on the dove. And I realized like uh, just this year, January, I suddenly realized I like, man, I, I've gotten really comfortable. I started to think that I was really good at it. And you know what's funny is the breakthrough stopped happening. In January, I, 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 like, I wasn't seeing any breakthrough in this area because I, I live a life that I, want, I feel indebted and responsible for breakthrough. The world, I owe the world that. And I, and I've, it, it, I realized it was just I got my eyes off of him and onto all the stuff. And we can gaze at a lot of things. I could gaze and go after 20 things, you know, evangelism, prayer, the word, worship, you know, and we're juggling all this stuff that we think makes up the Christian life. And before we know it, as we're pursuing and going after these 20 things, we've lost the one thing. But if we set our life on pursuing the one thing, we'll have everything. I'm just, I'm just raw today, man. I'm just, this is just in my heart. I'm just like, I'm just so... I'm just hungry. I feel so hungry. Like, I don't want to, I've just been lately, like, crying out, like, God, I just do it again. Like, let, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. Like, miracles and all these things, yes, it's the command of God, but I don't want to be that guy where I stand before him, and he's like, you did all this stuff, but I never knew you. I want to know him. I want to host his presence. What if we hosted his presence so well that we actually didn't even have to depend on our evangelist gift? <laughs> And people just responded because of the, what we carry, not because of what we knew. Because people will actually catch more than more the vibe you give off than the words you say. And that's the difference between, that's what makes a difference of presence versus just evangelical. Like I, We could do all the right stuff and be evangelical, be evangelistic, but it won't have any power. It'll just be like a track or just be like, you know, words. Unless it has the presence. You know, there's a psalm, Psalm 91, 1. It says, those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Remember where like Peter would walk around and people would be healed by his shadow? I'm thinking it's because he was dwelling in the secret place. So then he was overshadowed by the shadow of the Most High. So then his shadow became his sh God's shadow. Or God's shadow became his shadow. 
what would what would it look like for when we walk in a room it's no longer our presence that enters the room it's his presence that enters the room because if people just get me they honestly won't get much like I, I'm not trying it's not a belittling thing like I know I'm a son of God I know I'm loved and I know I'm an amazing person you should get to know me I'm just saying like I, it's not a, it's not a worth thing I'm just saying like we're all amazing people we're valuable but at the end of the day even at our best we aren't what the world is crying out for. The world isn't crying out to have an encounter with Micah. The world's crying out to have an encounter with Jesus. And what would it look like to dwell in the secret place in, so much, in such a way that your presence becomes the presence of Jesus? What it comes down to is awareness. I realized I quench and I grieve the Holy Spirit when I just live unaware of him. If I live unaware of the dove and I get more aware of praying for people and, you know, oh, my, I got a Bible study and I need to pray and, and I get more aware of even all the Christian stuff and I stop focusing on him, I won't host him properly. So, of course, I'll grieve and I'll quench him as I go throughout my day, which I've realized I've been very guilty of as of lately. <laughs> but, if, but if I live with an awareness, and this is what dwelling in the secret place means, it doesn't mean that you have to spend hours a day soaking that's, that's not practical, right? We got stuff to do. <laughs> it means you live with an awareness of him. Some practical things, I want to give four or five practical things of how you can be aware, how you can host the presence of God. One is, there is a real thing of, number one, really top priority, is actually take time to sit with him every day. It's not about the quantity, but the quality. Like we could call this devotion time, devotions, or you know, getting up early in the morning, when it, or in the evening, whenever it works for you. But there is something really powerful of actual actual time spent in His presence, because you actually get familiar with how He feels and how He hear, how He sounds, in that quiet place outside of the busyness of your day. But then num- number two, you know, we enter into the busyness of our day. So how do we stay in that place of dwelling in the secret place in the midst of all of our stuff? You know, we got kids screaming on the drive here. I, I've been sick a little bit this weekend, and we got literally to massive tantrums probably the whole drive here. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> let me be aware of you. Well, I'm like, well, I'm almost p- pulling a, a Midge Simmons. Like, <laughs> like I'm like, I'm kind of like slapping a little bit, but also like, Jesus, come. I love your presence. I love your presence. <laughs> so how do, you, how, do you, how do we dwell in the secret place in the midst of our stuff? Number two would be take time throughout the day to give attention to him. It can literally be 30 seconds or a minute. One of the things that I do just to turn my awareness and turn my attention to him is thanksgiving. Whatever you're thankful for increases. When Jesus broke the bread, he gave thanks, and then it multiplied for 5,000. Whatever you're thankful for increases. So I'm like, thankfulness is so powerful. So a lot of times for me, what it'll look like is just throughout the day, I'm just, I, I put this on my lips. I just say, praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. And you can't help but give thanks and pray. If you, if you thanks and praise, you won't help but be more aware of that thing you're thanking and you're praising. <laughs> or the person you're thanking and you're praising. So take time throughout your day, just little stops. Maybe you're in this busyness and just take time to acknowledge him. I acknowledge you. Thank you. I love your presence. That's another one. Just I love your presence. I give you my praise. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Just keeping your heart in tune with him. Number three is it says in the Bible to make a melody in your heart. You know, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, it talks about making melodies and songs and There's something powerful about melody. It says that he's enthroned on the praises of his people. So, you know, spending time with him, acknowledging him throughout your day, and then even little melodies throughout the day. We try to have, like Aaron and Cole were talking about, we try to have music playing in our house. But then if I don't have music, I'll just, even if I, if I, just, I'll just make up a melody. Jesus, I love you. (laughs) Like throughout the day, just singing, make a melody. Another one would be meditate on the word. Um, I, sometimes maybe you just pick a verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, you know, or maybe uh, whatever it could be. I mean, it could literally even be Jesus wept and you just think about that. Whoa, Jesus has compassion for me. <laughs> and finding a verse, 
maybe that came from your time with him in the morning or in the evening, and throughout the day, you think, you think about that verse. You kind of f- focus your mind on that verse. Because I, I think about even with Meredith, like one of the greatest ways that I actually acknowledge her presence is through listening to what she has to say, which sometimes I'm not the best at. But I'm just saying, like, one of the most ways, greatest ways you can honor and acknowledge somebody's presence when they enter a room is to listen to what they have to say. The last thing I would say is honor. Not just honoring when you feel him or when you hear him. You know, almost stopping in your tracks for a minute. If you feel something or you hear him, just to allow that moment to, to give a little time, you know. It could literally be one minute, but that would, I mean, but also honoring what you see on other people's lives. Honoring the presence or the breakthrough you see on other people's lives and not letting it lead you to jealousy or competition, but actually celebration. You celebrate the grace and the presence on somebody else's life. I'm going to end with this story here, and then we'll stand. But I remember it was probably like, I don't know, seven years ago. I felt like, I felt this, that responsibility. Like I, I felt this, this th- just the reality of like, man, Jesus, I want to live the life that you modeled for me to live. And I, I kind of, the Lord spoke to me because I felt like the first three years of being a believer, it was like, you know, one foot forward and then felt like 10 steps back. And you're kind of like, you know, you're really battling. And I felt like I was contending for this life that I wanted to live. And, and about three years into walking with the Lord, I felt like the Lord spoke to me this clear word. He said, Micah, recklessly abandon yourself to the calling on your life. And I knew what he meant. I knew that he meant the call to heal the sick, to walk like he walked. And it, it, there was this thing that rose up in me. It was like, this is what I'm supposed to live. I, I, I'm going to recklessly abandon myself to it. I don't need to be afraid of being deceived. I don't, I don't need to be afraid of, of excess, of, of pursuing the supernatural too much. I recklessly give myself to it. And around that time, I, I went out with a friend for four months straight. We started going out and doing treasure hunts every night in the midst of our schedule. We had, you know, obviously we were single guys, so there was a little, lot more flexibility than I have now. But we, we basically, you know, we would, after the end of our work and all the stuff we were doing, we would just meet up together and we'd go out five days a week for four months straight, just going out to demonstrate in our mall. And we would just go consistently, 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 consistently. And we were praying for people. We were getting prophetic words. We were getting words of knowledge. We were, you know, just praying for anybody and everybody. But for two months straight, nothing was happening. Nobody was getting healed. We prayed for tons and tons and tons and tons of people, probably hundreds of people. Nobody was getting healed. It felt like prophetic words were just falling flat. And I got so frustrated. I said, what is the difference? Why? Why is nothing happening? Why aren't people actually getting healed? Why isn't anything working? And it drove me to this hunger. It drove me to YouTube. And I started watching all these YouTube videos of Bill Johnson and people like Heidi Baker and all these different ones where I saw that they had what I was longing for. And as I watched their videos, every single one of them had the same answer to what to bearing fruit in the miraculous. You know what it was? Hosting the presence. And my attitude shifted. I remember the day where suddenly my attitude shifted and I was like, I don't want miracles. I, I'm not going to just focus on miracles. I'm not going to focus on prophesying over people, encouraging people. I'm just going to gaze at you. And then it shifted. We, we would pull into the parking lot of the mall and just spend two minutes, like I'm telling you, just being aware, just turning our attention to him. Rather than being in a rush to jump out of the car and just do evangelism, we shifted to let's just, let's just acknowledge him. And, it, and we would sit in there just for a couple minutes until we actually felt aware of his presence. And then from that place, we started going into the malls. And I'm telling you, stuff started happening. People started falling out and getting slain in the spirit in the mall. People started getting healed. People started getting encouraged and people started encountering Jesus and it was through the presence. Amen. Would you guys stand with me?
to summarize kind of what we talked about today, Jesus is revival. He is the model of the life that we're meant to live. But it's an impossible command. But the presence of the Holy Spirit is what makes the impossible possible. And we can host the presence by simply being aware of him every day. So I just want to pray for you guys. I feel like, um, just to encourage you guys, like I said, in Titus, it talks about how we've all received the Holy Spirit. We've all been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. When we said yes to Jesus, the, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit came into us, came inside of us. It's like when Jesus breathed on the disciples before Acts chapter 2. He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But then in Acts chapter 2, he said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from the Holy Spirit. So there's this weird thing of the indwelling presence and the presence upon. And God, he's, Holy Spirit's eager to to come upon us. It's what he's excited to do. And I just want to like make an invitation. If you're, if you would like, if I I just feel like for all of us, let's I'm just going to pray, play a blanket prayer for all of us. And I, I, I'm receiving this, but maybe, maybe you're, you're, you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe, you know, the evidence of the Holy Spirit being upon you is power. I, I, it's, it's not one emphasized gift of tongues or different. I, I would say tongues, all these different things are beautiful expressions, but it's just him being upon you, that you're empowered to live the life that is impossible. And so I'm just going to pray for us. If you just want to hold out your hands and close your eyes. And we'll just pray together. And I just want more, you know. I want more. I told you my story when I was 17, but I'm like, do it again, Jesus. <laughs> I'm ready for more. So why don't you just pray, say this with me. Just say, thank you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm a little unsure, sometimes a little afraid, but I trust you. Come and fill me with your presence. So right now, Father, I just ask you just to fill my friends. Fill us, God, with your presence. Holy Spirit, just come and baptize us in your spirit. Come and baptize us in yourself. We welcome you. Praise you, Father. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I feel like some of you. You. I feel like you're feeling something right now, and maybe it's something you've never felt before. Maybe you're feeling like a warmth or a tingling or something going on in your body or you're feeling peace or something. And I I just feel like I want to acknowledge that and and be thankful for that. Like if you could just raise your hand, if you were feeling something as we began to pray, something that was kind of overwhelming you. Come on, that's awesome. Jesus, we just acknowledge your presence. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for uh, just filling us. It's a gift. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to earn it. Even if, we, even if you didn't feel anything right now, it is bound to come. <laughs> I feel like God just painted a target on you, and he's like, I love you. I'm pursuing you. I'm going to overwhelm you with my love. <laughs> I'm going to overwhelm you with my presence, that you'll get to know him more. Amen. Amen. Well, man, I I just love you guys. I encourage you. Look for ways to be more aware of his presence throughout your day this week. Uh, We're learning. We're growing. I'm going to be intentional to do that too. And uh, I just love you guys. Really appreciate you guys. And um, just thankful for all of you. So you guys have an amazing day. Say say hello to somebody. Say hi to somebody. Uh, And talk to somebody as you're leaving. Just bless you guys. Bless you guys.